At Breaking the Glass Slipper, we believe it is important to have conversations about women and issues of intersectional feminism within science fiction, fantasy and horror. To continue to do so, we need your help. Please consider supporting us on Patreon. Join the conversation by following us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Welcome to Breaking the Glass Slipper. I'm Lucy Hounsom. And I'm Charlotte Bond. For our first episode of 2022, we are going back to the 18th century to look at the women who wielded power and the means they used to gain it. What challenges did they face? Are they remembered more or less favourably than their male contemporaries? And if, say, they had magic at their disposal, how would they use it to even the gender playing field? Joining us for this episode is Kate Hartfield whose novel, The Embroidered Book, explores the stories of two sisters in the 18th century courts of France and Naples. Thank you so much for joining us, Kate. Uh, Would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm Kate Hartfield. I am a Canadian writer, as you can probably tell by my accent. (laughs) And uh, I write science fiction and fantasy of all kinds, uh, usually with a historical setting. My first novel, uh, Armed in Her Fashion, came out a few years ago, and I have a couple of time travel novellas, uh, Alice Payne Arrives and Alice Payne Rides. And I also write um, games, so I have some interactive fiction out there, and I'm working on an Assassin's Creed tie-in novel uh, that's coming out uh, this summer. Yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. So that's my current work in progress. And the embroidered book is coming out. uh, It's a big historical fantasy. Uh, and it's coming out in uh, in February in the UK and May in North America. And it is the story of Marie Antoinette and her sister Charlotte, uh, who was Queen of Naples. And uh, it posits that they were secretly magicians. Uh, so it, it's all fitting within the known history, but there's uh, magic going on uh, in the background. And it follows them from when they were quite young teenagers uh, being sent off to marry uh, kings. Uh, all the way up to the French Revolution in the 1790s. The whole thing about let them eat cake. <laughs> I had a feeling that this is totally false, this attribution um, that they they said. They claimed Marie Antoinette said this when the peasants were starving. And I looked it up and, yeah, apparently it came from Rousseau, who mm-hmm. couldn't possibly have known Marie Antoinette at the time, and that it sounds like uh, anti-monarchists seized upon this um, and chose Marie Antoinette as the like, the perfect target to express this extremely, you know, unsavory view of of common people, um, yeah. and that I don't know. That just seems to me. I, I feel like I'm gonna I'm gonna jump right in here and say that when women play this this key role you know in a major historical event are they judged more harshly um for the, than their male contemporaries because i just feel like louis the 16th doesn't receive this same level of um obsession like we we seem to judge his wife uh, much more harshly than we do him yeah, absolutely. And it was true at the time as well. Uh, you know, Marie Antoinette was the target of really just nasty, nasty cartoons and and uh, rude poetry and, um, you know, horrible epithets all almost all through uh, Louis' reign, uh, but particularly, of course, in sort of the last 10 years. Uh, you know, she was called Madame Deficit because she was blamed for France's deficit, you know, not the American war, <laughs> which was the real cause of the deficit. Um you know, which was not her decision at all, Uh, you know, and uh, terrible um, nicknames and things made up about her all the time. And the let them eat cake thing, I think it is quite emblematic that the one thing everybody knows about her uh, is false. And uh, yeah, historians are have a strong consensus that it is false, that it's been said about several people through history and, um, you know, predates Marie Antoinette, as a matter of fact. So it seems quite unlikely she ever said it. And in, in fact, she actually expressed quite a lot of concern uh, during the famines in France about what people were eating. So it just doesn't seem in character at all. Um, Yeah, I had a quote from that. Apparently, she said, it is quite certain that in seeing the people who treat us so well, despite their own misfortune, we are more obliged than ever to work hard for their happiness. So that doesn't sound like someone who is is totally uncaring. Yeah, she was very soft-hearted. And, you know, she was very 
touched by people. Um, you know, obviously she was a very flawed person. I don't want to get around that and extremely privileged and made many, many mistakes. Um, but when it came to a sort of one and one to one relationship with people, she just had the softest heart in the world. And she actually adopted a whole bunch of children uh, because she wanted to give them a better life. And it was, you know, it was very much a sort of rich white lady um, sensibility towards these children. But definitely the idea that she just wanted to party and didn't care about anyone else is just completely made up. Kind of linked in with that question. Do you think one reason that we have such negative opinions of historical women is because we're kind of influenced by the generally patriarchal slant of history? So obviously a woman seizing power that people should, you know, belong to a male, they always come to a bad end. I mean, I know right at the beginning of the book, you talk about um, Marie, uh, Marie Antoinette's mother telling her how she won power, but they called her King Maria because they <laughs> couldn't, uh, you know, have this idea that a queen could be such a leader and could lead armies and could solve all these things. So do you think it's sort of a case of because history is written by, I say in air quotes, the winners or maybe the men, that mm -hmm. this patriarchal slant has kind of changed what we think of these women? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the main reasons I liked the idea for this book and decided to pursue it is that I realized that there were several women in 18th century Europe who were extremely powerful. And they all used their power in, in quite different ways. And they all had to deal with the problem of having a husband in different ways. You know, Catherine the Great dealt with it by, you know, conveniently having him killed. <laughs> so, you know, that's one way. Um, you know, possibly, you know, she, we think she probably hadn't killed. Um, but yeah, Maria Theresa dealt with it in a different way. So the the empress who was the mother of Charlotte and Antoinette um, could not be Holy Roman Empress in her own right because of the way the law was written, uh, even though she sort of inherited that position. And so she married someone and made him emperor, but then she ruled anyway. And then when her son became emperor, Emperor Joseph, she still continued to rule anyway. Um, so she just found a way around it. Um, and yeah, there was this wonderful little fact that I found that when she was uh, crowned, because she also did rule in her own right, she ruled some some Habsburg kingdoms in her own right. And uh, she was declared king. And Elizabeth I actually re referred to herself as a king uh, at least once as well. Uh, and I thought that was really fascinating, the idea that um, you have to, you know, almost the way that Lady Macbeth says, you know, unsex me here, that you almost have to um, put gender aside to wield power in a certain way, or do you? So I thought that was an interesting question. Absolutely. And I really loved looking at the, the gender dynamics. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is the majority of the book is obviously when uh, Charlotte and Marie Antoinette are in their new kingdoms, but you start off in the very close and compact German Austrian um, court, which is run by Empress Maria and sort of by her son Joseph. And you have this really wonderful kind of dynamic. So you've got, you still got men versus women, which obviously comes through in, in the rest of the book and is an inevitable part of writing a historical novel. Um, but at the beginning, it's very interesting. You've also got the children versus the mother and Maria versus Joseph. And it's not always Joseph that wins. And you've got this really wonderful i can't i can't even sum it up because it just defies explanation but all of these different gender dynamics depending on whether you're male and whether you're married whether you're unmarried whether you're a mother i mean how much of that did you create for the book and go this would make a really interesting tension and how much did you kind of get from history definitely uh almost all of it is from history i would say so uh yeah, I, I really drew all the themes from what I was reading. And sometimes I would invent a scene to illustrate it or, uh, you know, a magic spell or something to illustrate it, because obviously the magical bits are made up. Um, you know, I can I can come out and say that. <laughs> so, But most of the non-magical bits are, are actually not made up. So it's it's quite a lot of real history. <clears throat> and uh, the that dynamic uh, is a real thing. So the Empress really did use all of her children as pawns in the marriage market uh, to try to cement the alliance with the Bourbon family, or Bourbon, depending on how you want to say it. Um, and 
that alliance was so key because uh, Austria and France had been at war and they were not anymore. And now they were worried about England. England was on the ascendant uh, or Britain was on the ascendant. And, um, you know, it was so key to Austria that you have this mother who is just literally expending her children in a way and sort of saying, okay, well, I don't care if you're happy. I don't care if you marry someone who's going to be extremely abusive to you. What matters is Austria. What matters is the empire. And uh, that's, you know, that's your duty before God as a woman is to go and, um, and be a wife and, and be a queen. And the interesting thing about that to me is that she was not very much like that herself. She was this weird tension internally where she had this domestic feminine virtue uh, mentality where she, you know, she wanted to be a sort of housewife in a lot of ways with her husband. But at the same time, she was never going to give up political power. So she was a bit of a hypocrite in that way, in that she told her daughters to go off and be good, submissive wives. But they also had to be ambassadors for Austria, and they also had to further her aims in the empire. And they really had these impossible tasks before them. Uh, so I admire her a lot, but she she is, um, you know, not portrayed all that kindly in the book. And I think from the perspective of her children, uh, she was this sort of terrible figure that they adored and it was a really complicated relationship that Joseph had with her and also some of the other children. Um, I don't get to talk a lot about Amalia, who was one of the daughters, but Amalia just didn't talk to her for a long time. She just went off to Parma and didn't write because she was so angry at, at her mother for all of this. I, I sense there could be a good prequel here if you could find a way to work magic into it because she was such an interesting <laughs> character. And like you say, you come in right at the point where there is all this extra stuff been going on. It was just fascinating. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think there's a lot uh, going on at the edges and I, I definitely felt that I could have made this um, you know, a huge long series, but it's already quite long as it is, so I had to stop somewhere. <laughs> so you've mentioned magic a few times um, and magic Obviously, it appears a lot in fantasy books and it can be a curse and a blessing. I know working personally um, as a writer working with magic systems, um, there's quite a lot of consideration that you have to take with how far the magic uh, can go and what kind of things it can do and who can wield it and who can't. But if we're looking at it from a, you know, the idea of magic possibly allowing women to um, attain more power than they might otherwise uh, in a non-magical society. How can the idea of magic or this concept of magic um, facilitate a way out of powerlessness for women in a very patriarchal setting? Yeah, that uh, that's really interesting to me. I, I'm mostly using magic as a metaphor for power, which I think a lot of us do, uh, you know, that it's it's such an easy way to kind of literalize power and talk about different ways of wielding power. And so when I was designing the magic system, I was thinking about the ways in which these women did wield power despite the patriarchy that was all around them and uh, the ways that they, they did it differently. Um, so Charlotte is a very politically minded person, uh, you know, and she historically was, she was uh, very interested in ruling a country and she just like Catherine in Russia, she, uh, you know, she was reading all the philosophy, she was up to date on the latest ideas, and she really wanted to create this utopia in Naples. And so she went there as a, a teenager, and had these grand ideas that she was going to uh, be this great queen. Uh, whereas Antoinette was quite different. And she, uh, she was a much more domestic person and was much more interested in just being a good wife and in pleasing people and in having friendships and relationships but both of those things were powerful and Marie Antoinette's power was in those relationships you know she actually did historically have uh, a lot of influence and a lot of uh, friendships and um you know that you know that's why she got accused of having too much power is that she did have a lot of networks at Versailles that she had cultivated to try and make sure that that you know, she got her way. And she did have that Austrian connection that she was always thinking about. She did have opinions on things like the American war and, and how to run the budget and everything else. So they were both wielding power in these different ways. And I thought, well, isn't it interesting to think about how magic could reflect that, that you could sacrifice different things and get different things out of it. And it would be um, sort of a literalization of 
the idea of, you know, what do we, what choices do we make in our life and what are we going to give up for power and what kind of power do we want? I thought it was really interesting that your magic system kind of reflected the outer politics as well. Because we've very much, I'm having to check my notes, so many characters in your books, I have to remember them all. <laughs> you had um, the Ertag governess at the beginning, and you have Charlotte and Marie Antoinette, and you have Genevieve. Um, all these women who are practicing in magic, but they're kind of what you call in your world rogues. They're not part of the established practice. They're not part of the I can't do my air quotes again, brotherhood, which is obviously people like Solomon and Rohan and things like that. So, I mean, what made you think, you know what, I'm going to have exactly the same sort of gender dynamics within magic? Because quite a lot, quite sometimes you see that magic is sort of just kept for women, you know, you get the idea of witches and things like that or mages or whatever. But I really liked how you put the interplay between it. So what kind of nudged you in that direction to make it almost reflective? Yeah, I I think I did want to work within the history to a certain extent, and um, you know, when you when you start a historical fantasy novel, you always have this question at the beginning. You know, are you going to make it a secret history in which it happens within what we know, um, but behind the scenes, or are you going to make it an alternate history and and change what happened in history? And the embroidered book is a little bit nuanced in that regard. Uh, you could you could look at it either way. I think to some extent. Um, but for the most part, I did want to um, work within what we knew about history and almost explain it in a way and use magic to illuminate what actually happened rather than saying, wouldn't it have been cool if this had happened instead? Um, I think both of those approaches are great, and I do both of them from time to time. But in this case, I, I really wanted to kind of just shed a light on the history by making it weirder. Um, and then that sort of, you know, paradoxically shows us how weird the real history actually was. Uh, so I did want to have that power dynamic there. And um, the Order of 1326, which is the um, the society and the secret society in the book that controls who can use magic, is an explicitly male society. And it's a brotherhood and uh, women are not allowed. Uh, monarchs are not allowed for um, reasons, uh, you know, they don't want them to get too powerful. And, you know, they really try to tightly control magic. But of course... Uh, as with all things, um, whenever there seems there's a, an attempt at a top-down control of something, um, things leak out the edges, and uh, there are rogues, there are people who are doing magic, despite the rules of the order. And uh, that also allowed me to talk a little bit about the Enlightenment and about the things that were changing at that time, and the way that established authority that did go back to the Middle Ages um, was being overturned and could not survive. Uh, and uh, the, the people who pushed back against that and the people who were trying to preserve the old order at all costs. You're talking about order and the brotherhood, and I'm just thinking Assassin's Creed. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I had no idea at the time that I would end up writing an Assassin's Creed book. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, secret societies and, and brotherhoods uh, seem to follow me around for sure. <laughs> How do you believably keep the use of magic to a limited group of people in a world? Because often magic is so game changing, um, you know, particularly if oh, it's only wielded by a certain group of people. You, you very often then, you know, it, it ends up with the haves and the have nots in a very obvious way sense um, you know one group has extreme power and one doesn't I mean how would you um, possibly in your own book but also if you have any other kind of wider ranging thoughts on this because um, it, it's a bit of a pitfall sometimes I think when you when you incorporate magic in because you really have to lay down the ground rules quite early as to you know how it's really going to affect the structure the social structure of your world mm-hmm. yeah absolutely and that takes a lot of thought and I think uh you know, there's a lot of ethical decisions that go into it and uh, the world building behind it can break things in your plot, uh, you know, so easily just from a practical standpoint as a novelist. Um, so deciding who gets magic and how they get magic and how they get to wield it um, is such a big part of it when you're writing anything that involves magic, for sure. Um, and it fascinated me to read um, H.G. Perry's novel, A Declaration of the Rights of Magicians. Uh, and the sequel to that novel is out now, too. Because that's another novel that has magicians in revolutionary France. And um, I had, I think I had just sold 
my novel, like I had just got the deal for my novel um, when I heard about hers and I thought, oh, oh no, <laughs> there's another novel coming out and it was coming out earlier than mine about magicians and revolutionary France. I thought, oh God, it's going to, it's terrible. You know, this is going to wreck my novel. But of course, no two novels are ever the same. And uh, her novel is completely different and has um, focuses a lot more on the revolutionaries and the magic system is also completely different and has um, a much more sort of innate kind of magic, but how you're allowed to wield it is, is state controlled. And it's, it's a metaphor for state control and for overturning state control in a different way than my magic is a metaphor for a sort of, um, you know, individual uses of power. So, which is a, a sort of simplistic way of, of talking about what's going on in her book, but I really recommend it. It's a, it's a fascinating novel. Um, and so I think uh, I, when I started writing mine, I, um, I had, other historical fantasies in mind. Um, you know, the big one I think that is always top of my mind <laughs> is uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell and the limitations of magic there and how um, how individual it is, you know, where you only have two magicians uh, in a world who can wield magic. Um, so I did have to make those decisions about, about who got it and why. Um, one thing that I really did not want to do in this particular book is have it be uh, inborn. I, I wanted it to be a learned skill because I thought that would allow me to talk about uh, the values of the Enlightenment and and who got power that way. And also because I think when you're talking about inborn magic, um, that does open up all kinds of other cans of worms that I didn't want to deal with in this book. Yeah, I mean, not least of which is stuff like The Chosen One. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I must admit, reading your book, I found that the magic system was a lot more stringent than others he i mean lisa mentioned the chosen one there remember i must admit i did not enjoy jonathan strange mr norrell so i don't really remember that very well but <laughs> even with innate magic systems or even where you have to it has a cost i found that your your cost was really really high because they pay with memories they pay with affections and it's something crucial and each time they they do it. Each time they cast a spell, they lose something of themselves, which is not something I've seen in a lot of fancy, or at least not in such a personal way. Um, so, you know, what, what made you think, you know what, I'm going to get them to lose all of their emotions and <laughs> do that? Was it because of writing a historical something? Would you have done it differently if you'd done a high fantasy setting, for example? Was it to distinguish it? Or where did you come about um, with those particular rules? Um, I think it came from two different directions. Uh, one of them was just the practical uh, restrictions of of writing the plot, and uh, the other, more interesting one, is is from the history. Um, so, on, on the practical side of things, for for you know the novelists in the room, um, anytime you have a magic system, the problem always becomes, well, how do you have conflict in a world where people can do whatever they want? So, you know, there has to be some limitation or some cost on magic. Um, you know, that's not necessarily always true. There are other ways of writing stories, but it is quite um, difficult for your plot if you don't have some reason why people would choose not to use magic in some cases or why they would run out of magic in some cases. Uh, so I knew that I had to have some sort of cost. And um, that's kind of where the history came in because you know, often when I'm casting around for ideas, I will just turn back to the history and uh, think about what it says to me thematically. And I was reading about Charlotte and, uh, you know, her, her formal name was Maria Carolina. So if anyone's looking her up, uh, she's often called Maria Carolina, but she went by Charlotte. And uh, she had this very interesting, tragic life where she did start out as this utopian uh, teenager who went to Naples and married this terrible king who was not interested in the business of government at all. And she managed to make herself the de facto ruler of Naples. And then, and she, and she was totally into the, all the enlightenment philosophy. So she was very much uh, like the character of Catherine in the Hulu show, The Great, if anyone has seen that. So she was very much like that, where she was very idealistic and wanted to create this perfect world. And then as things started spinning out of control all around her, she turned into a terrible tyrant and was, she had, she started running a police state. She had secret police, um, torturing people, killing people. Um, and, uh, you know, Napoleon was, was, uh, respected her because, you know, she was just as bad as he was <laughs> in a lot of ways. So that to me was interesting is that along the way, she felt that she had to sacrifice her moral core uh, for what she wanted. And uh, so that I thought, okay, well, how can I translate that into power? How can I 
what is it what is it that she lost along the way did she forget who she used to be did she forget how to love did she forget her compassion um and so i started developing this idea of sacrificing parts of yourself uh, some of it's quite physical and some of it is more abstract you did mention as part of that um that excellent answer kate about charlotte being obviously an actual historical figure and what we know about her and things and i was just just thinking that when historical women do achieve lasting fame, quite often the ones we remember best work in fields that are stereotypically female leaning. So you've got Florence Nightingale in nursing, Elizabeth Fry in welfare, you've got popular novelists, mothers, and obviously in this case, queens. Um, I mean, did that sort of influence you when coming to choose your characters? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was in my mind as I was reading about um, female rulers in the 18th century is that I hadn't learned about them, you know. I mean, all I knew about Marie Antoinette was the the cake thing and the fact that she lost her head. And, you know, all I knew about Catherine the Great was the horse thing, which is also not true. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, you know, nobody ever bothered to tell me that these women had done these amazing things. And, uh, you know, the... I think even at the time, too, there was this idea that women had to really kind of uphold uh, these ideas of feminine virtue in order to be considered great in some way. And so even in these uh, political environments, you have these queens in the 18th century, and they're all very, very keen to be painted with their children. Uh, so, you know, they, it was very important to them to be shown as being maternal, and they would actually kind of echo the Madonna and child iconography in their official portraits and that kind of thing. And, you know, when Marie Antoinette started getting in serious trouble, uh, she would have these portraits painted that uh, would symbolize her children as being her jewels, you know, like my real jewels are my children. So she'd have a jewel case behind her to show that that's what was intended by the painting and that sort of thing. So it was all very deliberate to say, you know, what makes a woman great is being a mother, uh, being nurturing and and all of that. Um, and I think that does, when we, when we feel that someone has fallen down on the job, that a woman's fallen down on that job, um, it, you know, we don't tend to remember them uh, as well. But I, I think we are doing a better job of that now. I think, you know, my kid, I have a son uh, who's almost 12, and I think he's starting to learn more about women in history in a more nuanced and complete way. At least I hope so. Like Kate, I'm a mother as well, and I've got a little girl, so I'm always keeping an eye on, you know, what does come back. And it's really lovely. We have a couple of bookseller friends, um, Lucy, of course, being one of the loveliest. Um, But one of our other bookseller friends uh, is always recommending excellent books with, you know, different characters, um, different themes and ideas. And I have to give a shout out to um, Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls, which we've got a copy of. And they are just brilliant. They It is a big hardback book. And it's got like one page and a random silly illustration. There's all sorts of different styles of illustrations. And it just gives you facts about a woman from history um, or, you know, even a woman today. And they've got all sorts of different people. I know that there's um, Elizabeth I, my daughter really likes reading quite a bit because they did her at school. And the information she got in the book was slightly different to what she was given at school because obviously, you know, you've got the standard whatever at school, whereas the Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls always pick something quite interesting um, and they don't sort of go with the stereotypes. And we really like that book, my daughter and I, uh, and we learned loads out of it. And it was particularly good when she was young and she was, you know, wanting to know about all of these things. Um, and it's just... It's just fantastic, and it does give you. It's got Florence Nightingale in it. Uh, I don't know if it's got Elizabeth Fry. I do you know. I'm going to go and check. <laughs> um, but it's got a whole host of people, like Olympic stars, um, people who you know have been very strong in trans rights and things like that. And it, it is a really excellent book. I, I highly recommend it. Oh, that's great! Yeah, my kid uh, loves history as well, and he he went through a phase where he was reading the who was series, which is an American series of uh, kids books about history. And that was my impression too, is that there were a a lot of people that I never learned about um, as a kid and uh, written in, uh, you know, quite an up-to-date and objective way. And uh, with all kinds of diversity that was not in uh, the curriculum when I was growing up. Uh, So that is really heartening to see. Well, without Megan here, I was desperately going to try and get in like a a Star Trek or a Star Wars reference, but 
I have oh, to. <laughs> Sorry. Gonna go, are you going to go there? <laughs> I'm not. I'm I was going to go Doctor it. Who, which is, you know, I still managed to get in Doctor Who. But they, they're doing, so, <laughs> I'm not so keen on some of the Jodie Whittaker episodes, but stuff like Rosa Parks. I mean, the only reason my daughter got into Doctor Who was because they did Rosa Parks at school about two weeks before it happened to be in the Doctor Who episode. And I went, do you know what? There's this really cool thing you might enjoy. And my daughter loved it. And the the Doctor Who with Jodie Whittaker has had quite a few interesting female characters in it and particularly historical characters. There's been a couple of series and I'd have to go back and, and rewatch them. But again, it's like you were saying, Kate, that stuff being put out for families, for children these days is looking at more interesting characters from history rather than just, you know, David Tennant marrying Queen Elizabeth I and things like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And it, it's really great to see. I, I'm not all caught up on the Jodie Whittaker uh, arcs, but uh, I did see the Rosa Parks episode and I thought it was really great. I want to ask um, a slightly tangential question because we are talking about uh, diversity. We're talking about gender equality. And it was just something I read in an article the other day um, about, um, actually about the so-called dark ages that are no longer should be considered dark. Um, you know, we shouldn't be saying we shouldn't be using medieval as a synonym for primitive anymore. Um, but it was it was an article about this idea that discussions of gender equality just didn't take place in these uh, eras where um, they, the the gender divide was just it was much more pronounced. It was less equal um, than the era we find ourselves in today. Um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that because. I always kind of feel that uh, we sit on our high horse here in the 21st century and say, oh, well, look at us now. We have all these important, necessary discussions and just assume that these poor, unenlightened people never spoke about um, gender equality. But I'm sure that's absolutely not the case. Yeah, I think that's it's absolutely true, is that... Um, you know, we have we have so many examples going back to antiquity of people talking about um, what are the rights of women in society, um, you know, and just speaking about European history, because that's what I know, um, you know, it, it's never as simple as we think it is. And it's, it's never as binary as we think it is. Um, and uh, definitely, once you get into the Middle Ages, you have people like Christine de Pizan writing The City of Ladies, uh, which is absolutely explicitly about the rights of women. Um, and then uh, in the 18th century, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft writing A Vindication of the Rights of Women in the 1790s. Um, so, you know, it goes back far, far, far before the first wave of feminism. Uh, and it was very much a topic that people were, were engaged with. And John Stuart Mill was very engaged with it. You know, there were men who were uh, writing about gender equality and uh, and the vote for women, you know, many decades before uh, that happened. So yeah, I think it is uh, one of those things where the the lens that we look back with is a bit <laughs> fogged up in in some ways. And uh, the French Revolution too, uh, you know, was this moment where the rights of women were very much in play. And and we see that with every revolution. I mean, the Russian Revolution is another great example where, uh, you know, once you start overturning. The structures of society, it is natural for anyone who has been oppressed uh, disproportionately in the old society to say, okay, great, you know, great, I'm glad to hear we're overturning society. Now at last we can have equality. And often what happens, unfortunately, is that, um, you, you know, the new order uh, is at least as bad or in some cases worse uh, when it comes to uh, oppressing people for various facets of their identity. And so what happened with the French Revolution is many, many women were revolutionaries and were there on the front lines at the barricades and and uh, not only in the 1790s, but in the subsequent revolutions in the 19th century and uh, found that uh, when the dust had settled, they had fewer rights than before. Um, so, uh, you know, <laughs> the arc of history can be a little bit complicated that way. Yeah, there's... Um... <sighs> I say I'm, I'm sounding unsure because, of course, it, you know, there's a lot of historians who argue for and against this because it's just so difficult to prove because there's no sources. Um, but something that I really and I like to believe this is the case um, is that Anglo-Saxon women had more rights uh, previous to the Norman conquest than they did for the next 1000 years. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I just like, I just thought it was cool, you know, it's that people are like, yeah. oh, you know, we, we, women's rights have made a natural progression. They're getting better mm -hmm. and better and better. I'm like, do you know what? This is totally not the case. It, it, I just can't believe that that 
is always so you know that it's it's up and down and people think that you know as you were saying that you know like they expect rights are going to be better um they think they'll be more civilized the order is being imposed and then actually we find that's not the case at all Mm -hmm. yeah and that's one of the things that i really like to push back with uh, to push back against with my writing is is you know these very simple things that we were taught as kids and i i absolutely agree i'm nodding along because i felt when i was a kid i was I felt that I was taught that, uh, you know, that women's rights were this sort of uh, stepwise progression, getting better and better and better, and that, you know, women didn't used to work, uh, when, of course, that's complete nonsense, and women have always worked, uh, you know, or that women didn't used to have property rights, when, in fact, um, as you say, you know, going back to uh, medieval and early modern and uh, and early medieval societies in Britain and Ireland, I mean, women could divorce their husbands, they had all kinds of property rights that were lost later on. And a lot of uh, what came about with the Enlightenment uh, actually was a constriction of rights for for many people. Um, and I think that's so important to remember because we, you know, the reminder that we can always go backwards, you know, that that things can happen that can take away people's rights and that we need to be vigilant about that. And I think that's a lesson of history that we need to really keep in mind. Did I hear you right that you said that the Enlightenment resulted in women's rights being restricted and the French Revolution mm-hmm. resulted in women's rights being taking a back seat as well. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. There were certain ways in which um, the Republic of France uh, did not uh, accord all of the same rights to women that had existed before. And I'm not, I don't have the same expertise in this that I have because, you know, I, I studied a great deal right up until uh, the Republic began and then I stopped because that's when my book stops. <laughs> so, uh, so I, you know, I'm not... Uh, by any means an expert on um, what followed uh, the revolution. But I know that there were, um, you know, quite a few French revolutionaries who were women. You know, when the terror began, I think uh, the uh, the free exchange of ideas uh, was no longer uh, an opportunity for anybody who was not on top of the hierarchy at that moment. And who ended up on the top, top of the hierarchy in that moment were the people most privileged uh, within the revolution. And so it sort of ate its own tail in a way. And a lot of the great ideals just fell by the wayside. That really strikes me as strange then from a writing perspective, because if you think about a lot of stories where you have magic in it, it's sort of a medieval setting. And Lucy was saying about the Anglo-Saxons having you know, quite a lot of power to the women. And I know I've done a lot of Viking research and basically the Vikings went off on raids and the women just stayed at home and did all the men's work and got to go and vote in the assemblies and things like that. So it strikes me as really odd that the places you would naturally expect a magical setting for a fantasy book to be are the ones where actually women had quite a lot of rights we've forgotten about, but somewhere like the 18th century Europe, where clearly there were an awful lot of rights that were taken away, um, seems like a brilliant place to set a magic story. And yet yours and this other one you mentioned earlier seem to be the only two. So, I mean, was that kind of what drew you to that, this particular point in history? Did you go, oh, wow, well, actually, there's there's a load of rights being eroded and no one's writing about it? Or did you go, oh, I really quite like that period. I'm going to have a, a look at it and then find that actually it was a really rough time for women? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it did occur to me that uh, even though, you know, Marie Antoinette has been written about so many times, uh, there was not a lot in the way of fantasy about her and about uh, that time period. Uh, you know, there are, of course, exceptions and um, you know, I'm not the first by any means, but it did seem like it was a bit underused as a setting for magic, for sure. <clears throat> and it did that paradox did really uh, interest me as well. Um, you know, I have a political science degree, so I have political philosophy nerdery going all the way back uh, to my undergrad days. And uh, like, it fascinates me that, you know, the Enlightenment, uh, on the one hand, was this time of, of wonderful ideals about equality and uh, and liberty. And at the same time, at that very moment, uh, and some of the same people were absolutely constructing race theory in a way uh, to bolster the slave trade and to bolster um, the economic hierarchy. And we're using these new ideas about science and species and segregating and uh, uh, categorizing nature to apply that kind of thinking to humanity and to say that certain people are less because of race and and basically just inventing the concept of race the way that we know it today at that same time. So while you have these wonderful ideals, we also had these extremely horrible ideas um, 
right along with it and almost built into it in a way. And so that idea of the enlightenment, of the seeds of the enlightenment being rotten, that they didn't flourish um, because there was something wrong <laughs> with the way it was all formulated uh, was really appealing to me. And also uh, that seemed like an interesting place to put some magic and to talk about, uh, you know, to talk about that sort of uh, interplay between decay and death and, and power and life and light and uh, how these two things can, uh, can exist at the same time and also can be mutually exclusive. I mean, I think that is a really lovely way to wrap up the episode, actually. Um, thank you so much for coming along and talking to us, Kate. Um, when, if, if you could remind everybody um, when the embroidered book is available. Yes, absolutely. So it will be available on February 17th, uh, 2022 in the UK in hardback and uh, audiobook and ebook and everything else. Um, and there is there are some lovely special editions out there. Waterstones has a gorgeous edition, uh, blue sprayed edges. Uh, Forbidden Planet has a signed edition. Uh, so if you're into the fancy editions, they are out there in the UK already uh, for pre-order um, at the time that we're recording this. And um, in the rest of the world, I think you can get uh, you know if you're very eager, you can get an ebook copy or a you know a book depository. Um, uh, import copy in February, or you can wait for your local bookstore to have it uh, in May. So the May May twenty fourth is the date for the US and for Canada. Fantastic! Like I said, thank you so much for coming along um, and being the first guest of our new season for twenty twenty two. Excellent! Thank you so much. I've I really enjoyed listening to the podcast, so I was very happy to be here. It's lovely to have you. Thank you, Kate. Breaking the Glass Slipper is written and produced by Megan Lee, Charlotte Bond and Lucy Hounsom. Please help us spread the word. Subscribe and leave a review on your preferred podcast platform. We want to hear from you. Let us know what you would like to hear on the next episode of Breaking the Glass Slipper.